Ready to get out into those gardens? Well, it's almost time. But first, let's assess what winter left behind and get inspired by artists who garden and by some gardeners who really know their stuff. A whole new season of Great Garden begins in 30 seconds. We grow a lot of carrots. People don't realize they can grow mountain laurel here. A lot of gardeners treat their gardens like art projects. We rely on bees for the food that we eat. Well, its common name is Angel's Trumpet. Gardening is definitely my quiet, quiet time. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish, here to begin our 17th season of this program. And we welcome back our resident expert, horticulturist and educator, Bob Olin, and a new garden professional who will be joining us this season, Deb Burns Erickson. Hey, Deb, thanks for taking the time to help us out. Really appreciate it. Well, I'm not, I don't have anything else to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, why not? Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit um, about your um, background. I am the third generation at Burns Greenhouse. My grandparents started it. Uh, my grandfather homesteaded it. And we have the fourth and the fifth generation is coming wow. this year on the farm. And mm -hmm. it's so exciting. I'm living the dream. So you've been gardening your whole life? I have, yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thanks again for, for coming. I think it's going to be fun to have you here this season. Uh, we also want to welcome and thank our phone volunteers from St. Louis County Master Gardeners. They're here to take your called in questions at 218-788-2844, or you can call toll free 877-307-8762, or you can even email your questions to askgardening at wdse.org. And I also want to mention that we um, have some new set dressings. If you take a look around, we've got these uh, the, the metal shovels and the decor, some butterflies. And those are provided by our new sponsor, North Star Landscaping Garden Center and Greenhouses in Hayward. And uh, they're helping us look better. And we want to thank them for their support. But um, now we want to take a look at what's going on outside. And there actually have been a few signs of spring. Our photographer, A.J. Larson, went out and, and found some things in the Twin Ports. I think that uh, few buds coming out there. There we go. That looks like maple. maple. That'll be the first that'll start to bud. Yes. Mm -hmm. What else are you guys seeing out there? Well, we're, we're going through the thaw process. It is still pretty early right now at this particular point. And nothing's so. thawing in Zim. Then not not, not Zim. a thing, huh? <laughs> Zim in the coldest, lowest spot there yeah. is. Yeah, those of you along the lake, if you feel sorry for yourself, yeah. you know, just Go, a little Take a drive track. to Zim yeah. yeah. the bog. Yeah. Uh, somebody in Superior told me they had crocuses coming up, but the rabbits already got a hold of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. we're going to have a lot of oh. potential more livestock damage, Absolutely. wildlife damage, obviously, mm -hmm. because of the... Uh, the tough winter that they had and they're Absolutely. hungry right now. Yeah. Another sign of spring we got from our colleague Greg Grell in Hermantown. There it is, the rhubarb's coming up. That's surprising, that was probably near his foundation. He said again, it is, uh, you know, on the south side. And, south side mm -hmm. near the foundation, a little heat leak there, so it's starting to jump. I would just comment, this is the only point at which deer really uh, will eat rhubarb. Generally it's the exotic acid that's in the leaves, but at this point, so if you've got rhubarb coming through and you've got a hungry deer population, mm -hmm. just drag a little screen or something over the top of it sure. for the next couple of weeks and you'll be okay. Okay, all right. Well, we want to talk about um, the impact of the winter weather and we have some pictures to go along with that. Um, Bob, this is uh, one sign of the winter damage that we're seeing. The winter just passed, which was a very severe winter, obviously very cold, lots of snow, and people were anticipating that we we're gonna have so much plant damage as we had the previous winter. But this is very typical. This is just what we call winter drying or winter desiccation. Notice we've got green along with the, uh, the browning. We're gonna mm -hmm. lose a few needles, but the, the plant itself is not gonna be killed. Sure. The previous year was totally different. Yeah, we have an example of that. Um, the there. winter of 1718, really a lot of people took a hit. Now that was a northern arborvitae, um, or a northern white cedar arborvitae, and it killed the entire tree. It's a native mm. species. And what really was happening was two winters ago, we had a very, very warm October, and then it got very cold without any snow cover. So all the moisture was up in the plant still, wasn't driven down, and then we had this- No storage. No, so we, we had this real severe loss. This winter was just the opposite. October was cold. All the juices and all the photosynthates were down in the roots. And then we had snow cover. 
So the cold weather and the wind that we had in January didn't make any difference. The plants were already protected. Mm -hmm. One other thing, tremendous sap mm -hmm. flow this year in the maples. Ah, and that's again because mm -hmm. of this phenomenon. Cold October drove all that moisture down into the roots. It's all coming back that's up at this particular point. Nice. So actually we came through pretty darn well. Yeah, mm -hmm. surprisingly yeah. because it was a hard, Such it was a, a long cold. winter, long and cold. cold. <laughs> I hate to say it. So glad to hear that we have a lot to look forward to in the spring and the growing season. We are really looking forward Absolutely. to the growing right. season. But right. as we always see, there's uh, often damage from the animals. Yeah, and sadly we get a lot of these questions I know you do as well mm -hmm. Deb but you can see here where not only it's the outer bark but on that right hand photo there you can see there's inner bark this is active tissue that's carrying the sugars right down to the roots so this particular unprotected tree so we always say plant a few less trees invest a little mm -hmm. bit in protection yes. of one type or another and then and then do it deer damage they're browsing everything it was yeah, very difficult for deer and we'll talk mm -hmm. maybe in another show about how we might prune this up but that's very typical deer damage We've changed our recommendations. I showed a shot back in our March program where the snow was above this guard, this column that was in there for protection. So we're gonna suggest that people still put the plastic mm -hmm. cylinder around the trees and then take a tree wrap and wrap it above just in the event that snow covers, snow came right up above the top of that. That one looked like they should replace that collar, that it's going to get too tight, too. That it's going to bind. The, that, that I mean, that can be as much of a problem as sure. girdling. And then what about the snow melt? It's been pretty gradual. We're very fortunate, and once again, we had a little snow before the cold weather came, so we didn't have a lot of frost in the ground. So it's been melting. We haven't had the runoff. We haven't had the flooding that people mm -hmm, anticipated, mm -hmm. but it's a been slow cool, melt slow been melt, mm -hmm. and then not a lot of frost, so most of that moisture has been absorbed, which again sets us up for a very good growing season. Absolutely. All good right. Good start, at least. Good. Mm -hmm. Good review. Well, it takes, uh, we're going to move on now to, to our uh, garden art. It takes a lot of study and work to become a master gardener, including a number of volunteer hours. Well, some master gardeners in northwest Wisconsin who are also accomplished artists log their community service in a unique way with a local museum exhibit. A lot of gardeners treat their gardens like art projects. They worry about the greens, different colors of green, the, the short things in front, the tall things in back. In my view, working with plants or vegetables or working in your garden is so inspirational. I mean, you see patterns and colors and it's, it's just endlessly fascinating. The show is called Inspired by Nature, Art Through the Eyes of Master Gardeners. We have quilts, we have white ash baskets, we have carved bird, birds, insects living off the garden. I mean, there are a lot of different media and we were striving for that. And what we would hope that you would find are the relationship between bugs and plants. You'd have ideas about things to plant in your garden for birds. You would see how people have interpreted their garden and different examples of a whole spectrum of art expression. We've had very good luck with this show, fortunately, because <laughs> it was a big project. <laughs> How many volunteer hours did you get in? Oh, probably hundreds and hundreds. <laughs> Those master gardeners work hard and the artists there are incredible. It was so fun to see that exhibit, unfortunately. That was last summer and it's, it's not there any longer, but you uh, can see lots of examples of, um, of gardens in the art that people do locally. And then I also wanna show you, um, Deb brought in um, some examples <laughs> of art that you can put in your garden. Absolutely, and these are uh, Michael Carr they are planters, but he's a sculptor, and then he also fires these um, and makes these beautiful, they're huge. That's mm -hmm. at least three feet tall. Oh, wow. So it takes up a good amount of space uh -huh. and gives you a real focal. Yeah, and the lemon coral. Lemon that, coral was planted in that one. Yep. And mm -hmm. then an another example of that, beautiful sculptures. Mm -hmm. Yep, and those are more sedums. And then those, you could bring them in in the winter. You have to, mm -hmm. to protect them. And then those uh, sedums would come back. 
Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. once you bring them back out again. It's great. Sure. You know, Deb, looking at those uh, wonderful heads, I've been told that gardening is kind of a head game. Is that right? Uh, <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> 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 okay, time to move on to some questions here. Um, there's one about uh, pruning, and we know people are going to have to get out and get do their pruning soon, or if they haven't already with some things. But when's the best time to prune a smoke bush? This comes from Janet in Foxboro, wondering, you know, how much should I cut back? And uh, I don't want to prune it too far because I do want it to come back. Right, and right. it's one that would come from the roots. It does, it does. But, but there's no point in taking the whole plant down. It's a multi-stem, so yep. if, you, if she took out a few of the stems mm -hmm. and then maybe cut back a third or yep. something like right. that. No more than a half. No yeah, more than never, a half. I, I would never. And then, then she's really got something that's going to look very nice coming mm -hmm. into, the, uh, mm -hmm. into the spring and the summer months. Right. A lot of these multi-stem uh, shrubs, really, if you take about a third every, every year mm -hmm. for th over a three-year period, that's a right. good way to Right, whether to up. the ground or at least the cover. Or right. Canopy. Now, Jerry from Hayward has a blue leaf willow and is oh. eight feet tall, also mm -hmm. wondering about pruning and how far down mm -hmm. she should go with that. The Arctic blue willow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's... Boy, you could do the same thing though. Same I mean, thing. if you don't want to be aggressive and you're worried about it, but you could cut that in half easily. That is so vigorous. And they just give you a really nice corally kind of movement to them. But um, yeah, she could shape it. Those things. Sure. And I think with a lot of people, they should really prune these things annually. What mm -hmm. often happens mm -hmm. is they let mm -hmm. things overgrow mm -hmm. and then a lot of that tissue gets so woody that it won't pop buds for you. Right, and then you're, like you say, remove a third. Then you gotta, you gotta then take, you gotta take it out, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So prune annually and take take a third of it at this time. And, right, and or it'll, like you say, don't back. plant as many, just take care of what you have. That's I mean, probably really. good That's advice good point too. for all of us. Uh, Louis, <laughs> 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 it's hard though, there's so it's much hard. great stuff out there. It's hard. I can't help it. Um, Louie has a sister who lives near the zoo in Duluth with a fungus on her house and he looked it up and thinks it's a blood tooth fungus. Have you ever heard of that? Well, that's pretty unusual. Yeah. But uh, I think it's pretty indicative. They do look kind of reddish and kind mm -hmm. of bloody. I don't think it's edible and I don't even want to go near identifying <laughs> uh, fungi like that. So I would just kind of enjoy it but stay away. Don't put it in the fry pan nothing. with your eggs. I, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I said, don't put yeah. it in the fry pan with your eggs. Uh, Mary Jo in Hibbing has a perennial garden and lawn two inches deep in road salt and gravel. What can I do to protect my perennials that have not yet poked out of the ground? Oh, so the salt's there. The salt should, and gravel are on it. She should try to get water on it right away. Get it out, get it at least rinsed out. I mean, it's going to kill the soil nutrients. So if she gets the salt off and gets it out, and then she's going to have to come back and add some nutrition to it and get the pH down because the pH is going to go up pretty high. Yeah, she will. She gravels. She'll want to take. It's one of the few times where you might want to use a garden rake and mm -hmm. let's get as much of that off as we can. And then your advice: as much water as possible. Mm -hmm, as that'll much. that'll leach it down. And then uh, hopefully, and she might want even a little fertility, but be kind of careful because that's salts as well. So right. And if she has some stress. really valuable perennials, she should dig them out. Mm -hmm. As soon as she can get a spade in the ground, she ah. should get them out, get them into something else, and then cleanse out that area because sure. it'll be dead. I mean, the soil will be dead with that amount of salt. Mm, makes sense. Okay, Jerry from Babbitt has green worms on her roses, lots of them, for three years. What can I do for this year? And of course, she wants <laughs> to do it without using any That's kind exactly of That's <laughs> exactly what I would be thinking. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Yeah. Oh, that's um, tough. You know, they're the, they're the larval form of mm -hmm. more than likely one of the um, one of the moths. Perhaps uh, if it's green, it's going to be a, a, a day, daytime moth rather than a nocturnal mm -hmm. moth. But um, I think the best thing she could do, if she's patient, is just pick them off. People don't mm -hmm. even look at that. Sure. But mm -hmm. you got a few roses. That's not that hard to do. Really. Right. And and sometimes we cheat a little bit. Um, we'll add a little bit of bleach to our water. I mean, rural, we don't have any bleach in our water. You know, urbanly, you guys do because they treat right. the water. But a lot of times, just even a, a slight amount of bleach, and then they're young and, and soft skinned, you can hit them with a little light bleach solution, and it will knock it back without doing any salt damage or salt burn to the mm -hmm. plant. Then we have a couple of biologicals that mm -hmm. might, might work. Uh, Dipel would be a product that you could try on that kind of a larvae. Okay. Uh, that might mm -hmm. be effective, and that's a, that's a biological bacillus. Mm -hmm. So there wouldn't mm -hmm. be any, any concern about that either. So right. you have a few choices. Uh, as you say, light application very light, of, very of bleach light, right, rather right. than maybe one part 
bleach uh, 10, 15 parts water, At something least, like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. All right, good options. We'll get back to more questions in just a bit. But now to our weekly tour. It's of a fairly small backyard garden, but has some huge appeal. Hi, my name is Scott Keenan. I'm married to Carrie Keenan, who is the gardener here. Uh, we live on Oneida Street in Lakeside, and welcome to our garden. I've been here th almost 35 years, but we've been married 25 years. And so I started gardening 25 years ago with my, my wife's guidance, of course, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. I, I converted from a runner uh, to a gardener. 12 years ago, we, we decided to put a river in and uh, just a wonderful place to, for the birds and the bees and the butterflies and dragonflies as well. And uh, so it's a fun little ecosystem. They multiply, you just buy two and they, they turn into a whole bunch. Still some day lilies and uh, oriental lilies are gonna start popping here pretty soon. It's about color and texture. Uh, I think that's the, one of the things that I learned from my wife, Carrie, is that we gotta have color, you gotta have texture and you've got to have a mix of annuals and perennials. But it's probably around 70, 30 perennials. We brought in the tiger's eye sumac, you know, because we wanted shade underneath and uh, it certainly got out of control and I love it. I kind of like gardens that are out of control. We have our vineyard here and uh, we, we enjoy our, our, our grapevines and you just got to look in there and they're, they're doing really well. Usually they're for the squirrels and the raccoons, uh, but uh, if we get them in time, we, we possibly can make some grape jelly out of them. The apples, uh, we got an abundance of apples this year. We're gonna use those and uh, we wanna have a little food uh, as you walk around our garden. You're gonna find food if it's raspberries or whatever. We've been getting our pint uh, day. It's winter walking onions and I'm thinning them out all the time. These, these will fall down and, and see themselves again. We always put parsley as one of our borders in, in this garden here. We put a lot of herbs in and uh, we got uh, basil, by the Swiss chard over there. It's been a great year for hostas. Backyard, we have a lot of different hostas and it's been a great year for them. And, and I've been spraying like crazy to keep the deer out. Some of the clematis uh, have ended already, but some come at different times. We put impatience in, you know, to give color. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that's the, a perfect annual sun patience and impatience and uh, <laughs> keep color all year. You gotta love them. When my wife's uh, mother Lola passed, we had an older gazebo in there. She just loved it here more than anything. And so there was a little money for all her, uh, for all the kids. So Carrie made sure that we got a gazebo in, in, in memory of Lola. But we enjoy it for company and family and, and friends. So we, we love to entertain and uh, it's a, a fun part of it. And you can hear the river. We do everything ourselves. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not a show garden, it's a backyard. So all of what we've done here is just a little bit at a time. We'll plant some more trees and we'll probably change things up, but I think we're running out of uh, territory here, space. A lot of people know Scott Keenan is the former race director from Grandma's and they have a beautiful garden there in Lakeside. You know, he talked a lot about texture and Deb, you um, brought some examples of mm -hmm. some things that can put great texture in your yeah. garden. What's this one this I'm holding? This is lemon lace sambuca. Mm -hmm. It's brand new. It's elderberry. So you right. get the elderberry flower, you get the elderberry berry, and that's the black lace sambuca elderberry also. And nice. it gives you the look of the Japanese maple yeah. without the Japanese maple. And the Japanese maples are not cheap. And yeah. not hardy. And they're not hardy, so you mm. really got to take good care but of them. But these do well. I've seen them in a lot of gardens. Yes. They're, they well, are. not the, this one's fairly Brand new. Brand new, yeah, mm -hmm. that I know of. And, and what's this here? That is blue teeny fuchsia, and it is an edible fuchsia. It mm -hmm. flowers, and then it'll give you, like fuchsias have a hip on them anyway that's a soft berry looking. Mm -hmm. This one is edible, and it's supposed to be a cross between a blueberry and mm -hmm. kind of a raspberry twist mm. to it. Oh, cool. Edible berry. Yeah. Not, not hardy, but an annual, and they're blooming up. And they, they like moisture, so they'd be sure. good in a wet spot. So Yeah. And we well, and some beautiful perennials that you potted up, too, that, um, you know, is a nice way to do it. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. and then you can bulk them up in your container like that, and then mm -hmm. you can put them in in the fall. And, or you could, and you can start them early, you can get them out early, because people are in a hurry in Mother's Day and in May to get something outside. They want to be the first one to have something outside right. that's a little bit nicer than their neighbors. Okay, uh, some questions, we're getting quite a few. Marie from Duluth wants to know, what's a good time to pr transplant a delphinium? Right, you know, right now, as soon as you can get a spade in the ground, might be a little early, but mm -hmm. uh, certainly by the end of April, okay. great time to move it. Cool, Shannon from Eveleth, what can I do to prevent vole damage to lawn and shrubs? Oh boy, <laughs> that, you know, under a heavy snow blanket like that, you are gonna get a lot of damage yeah. right there on the mm -hmm. turf layer. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, some of the better things you can do is just leave open, you know, people are against a little bit of grass, but actually open areas around the perimeter of your property because they're really shy, the, the overhead predators, uh, mm -hmm. some of the predator oh, birds and so forth. That's a good so a perimeter that's open around mm -hmm. your gardens is a good idea. Okay, um, Kathy from Lakeside removed her leaves from a bed of tulips. They're up three to four inches. What, what should I do? I think she's worried about protecting them. And she should oh, be, cause, Yeah, because yeah. she took the leaves yeah. all off. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Well, you know, you put take the them off and put the leaves back <laughs> on. Oh, no, no, not really. I mean, no. Well, it's, you got to be a little careful. Right, right, and is it a sunny location? Is she now going to get more heat, more solar heat, now that she's removed the leaves? And that would make a big difference than if it's in a cool area. But they should be in full sun, and they should be radiating a little bit of. A little bit. You know, we're, er, we're very early. That's what we mm -hmm. kind of have to remember. Mm -hmm. It's very early in April. We could still get some very oh, cold temperatures. Very cold. So my feeling, I, I'm a big advocate of having a bale of straw. And mm -hmm. if you need to, mm -hmm. just, just protect them. If, right, if or, a frost frost or a blanket or a polar fleece blanket. If it's a small area, polar fleece is awesome. If it's going really? to go below I, like 15 you know, degrees or lower, mm -hmm. then you could take a, just a polar fleece blanket or, or yardage mm -hmm. and put it out on it. For the evening, you sure, know, sure. it'll hold sure. 10 to 15 degrees. Who okay. needs them on your bed when you can right put on. them on another yeah. bed outside? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, Susan from Duluth wants to know, can I grow lavender in Duluth? A lot of people would love to. Well, you can. Yeah, during the during season. During the summer, <laughs> right? Um, but Hidcoat is a hardier, um, older variety. What's that called? Hidcoat, okay. H-I-D-C-O-T-E. Mm -hmm. um, it's a hardier, but it... it you're going to have to protect it. You're going to have to mulch it, and it needs a nice dry location because it's more arid. If it gets wet in the winter, it's, it, it won't make it. That would be okay. my concern. But. Good, good drainage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good drainage, uh, southern exposure, mm -hmm. plenty, of, plenty of mulch. Yep. There you can use that bale of straw as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this week's Grow and Show includes some things grown inside this past winter. Here's a look at that. Folks like John and Marcia Strumgren bloom some indoor beauty over the long winter months and share their selection of red and white amaryllis, here all in a row. Marcia's aloe vera plant also saw blooms for the very first time after many years in her home. And Lucy Priley brought back the blooms of her cyclamen for three years now by cutting back and letting it dry in summer, then watering in fall for flowers that start at Christmas and last for many weeks. Here's a sampling of the wonder we await in the outdoor garden from Denny and Lori Ryan of Chisholm, who grow gorgeous daylilies. Anne caught this shot of a hummingbird feeding on their bee balm and a monarch that emerged from a chrysalis in their garden and made its way to their cone flower. If you have garden beauty to share, please send your photos to greatgardening at wdse.org and let us show what you grow. We really want to see more of what you grew outside last season, so keep those pictures coming. Time for just a couple more questions. When's the best time to prune lower branches from my 10-year-old birch tree? This is from Mary in Duluth. You can do that right now. Uh -huh. they, of they, of course, are going to bleed, so you uh -huh. have to understand <laughs> that. So as long as they're small diameters, they're not going to hurt, but you can expect some bleed at this mm -hmm. point. And Lyle of Superior saw animal damage. Uh, should he cut it down, and anything else should be done for that? Well, we're going to prune up animal damage, mm -hmm. and in many cases, uh, you know, they need a good class in pruning because they don't do a very, <laughs> they don't do a very good job. Mm -hmm. But if they're just taking some of the laterals off, maybe that's a topic for another program where sure. we can show people how to mm -hmm. cut them back. Mm -hmm. It's that main stem that's so critical, and okay. if there's a lot of damage there, sometimes we have to prune at ground level and mm -hmm. kind of start yeah. over. Right. And uh, how do you kill snow on the mountain? I, I've been holding this one from Mary Jo, and we get this question a lot, but you had a, a thought. So you Deb. can use water softener salt. Oh. Okay, big bags, uh -huh. 50 pounds for $4. I'm a yeah. greenhouse I'm garden hack. So mm -hmm. you just you can lay it out. It will kill the soil. It will kill the plants. Uh -huh. But then you can let it go sterile for a year once you're sure it's all gone. And then you could um, then flush it, add good compost and change the pH and then start all over again. Okay. All right. Um, Bob, we want to just mention the big spring garden extravaganza coming up and uh, that's going to be with regard to a healthier life and environment. Yeah, it's, I'm pretty excited about this. We're just putting together the resource book. So we 
nearly 100 pages, and Dr. Mark Seeley is going to be joining us, a state climatologist, a tremendous background there, and we're going to take a look at 11 different workshops, uh, three different uh, keynote speakers, so we're going to look at uh, what climate change means, how we can uh, adapt to it, maybe some new crops that we're going to be growing in the future, as well as many, many workshop topics as well. It's going to be a good day. Excellent. Well, we encourage you to go to our website for updates, our season schedule, and special events. And there are still some tickets available for our summer bus tours, so look for that. Plus, you can find all the past episodes of this program and watch them online whenever you want. Uh, gosh, big thank you to our phone volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardeners. Um, Bob Olin, thanks as always. 17 years you've been doing this. And, you would uh, have to remind uh, me of that. I don't, I, I don't remember uh, you being stumped very often or, or maybe even at all. Um, Deb Burns Erickson, thanks for coming. We're just so glad to have you here this season. Thanks, you, great yeah. job. You know, I've known this family for a long time and it dates yeah. me, but I thought an awful lot of your grandfather. Uh, and, very kind. And the Sisu. I know there may not be yeah. a Finnish blood, but there's a lot of Sisu in that family. There's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Well, we want to thank all who called in and tuned in. We will be back again next week with another fresh edition of Great Gardening. Thank you.